Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're listening to us from today. Uh, my name is Simon Sutton. I'm the technical director for Doble in Europe, Middle East and Africa. And it's my uh, privilege today to have my colleague Mike Narbrook, who's going to be presenting today's webinar here with me. Before I introduce Mike, just a few uh, little bits of housekeeping for how we're going to run the webinar today. The webinar is going to take roughly about uh, 60 minutes, depending on how quickly Mike gets through the material. And then we'll use the remaining roughly 30 minutes for Q&A. Uh, so we'll handle all the questions at the end of the event. Um, and you'll see on the right hand side of your screen in the GoToWebinar control panel, a little tab labeled questions. If you click on the little arrow on the left hand side, that will open up the questions uh, dialog box and you can put your questions in there and to make life easier though if you click on the little box on the right hand side with the little arrow pointing out uh, from inside it that will undock the questions uh, tab entirely you can drag it to another screen it makes it bigger it just makes it easier to use um, put your questions in uh, I'll collate them and I will pose the questions to Mike at the end um, and just to let you know, we will be sending out a recording of this to you afterwards in the next day or two. So you will you will get the material as well. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce Mike. Uh, Mike Narbrook is a senior test engineer here at Doble and is based in the UK. Mike's main area of work is online condition assessment of high voltage assets, including generators, motors, obviously the focus for today's presentation. Buzzbar systems, transformers, cables, switch gears, etc. He performs EMI testing and both conventional and uh, unconventional PD surveys at power stations, substations, and other industrial sites throughout the UK and abroad, uh, as well as developing interpretation methods for EMI and PD. So, Mike, I'm going to hand over to you, and uh, we look forward to the webinar. Yeah, thank you, Simon. So, welcome everyone to this webinar: online testing of generators and motors. Start with, we've got uh, Doble's mission statement here, just to ensure that all people have reliable, safe, and secure energy by providing advanced diagnostics and engineering expertise for the energy industry. Uh, got a quick slide of um, Doble's history here. Over 100 years old now. We celebrated our centenary um, last year. Um, uh, but we have uh, some re more recent acquisitions in the past few months that we've um, had. We've got um, Altanova, the Altanova Group, which includes ISO and TechImp, and then uh, Phoenix Technologies as well. And uh, we're very, uh, very excited to be working with these guys um, in the future. So, what do we do as Doble? We uh, we do a, a lot of things. Um, my Main area of um, of work is condition assessment and uh, and training, uh, but we do all sorts of other things: uh, laboratory testing for transformer oil, uh, commissioning, acceptance testing, design reviews. Um, they will do do a lot. Um, so as as part of our training, um, this is this webinar comes under that sort of banner. Uh, training education. So hopefully um, a lot of you will have had some experience with Doble's webinars and training sessions uh, previously, but um, if not, um, please take advantage. The, all these webinars are, are free to attend um, and uh, got a lot of uh, very experienced presenters um, to come. So we'll go into the meat of our, our webinar now. Just a quick overview of what we're going to be covering. So, I'll do a brief introduction to condition based maintenance, and then we'll move into um, online testing as part of condition based maintenance. And uh, sort of five main techniques that, that we can use, um, use uh, for online testing. So, uh, we've got partial discharge analysis. Electromagnetic interference diagnostics, motor current signature analysis, vibration, and then we'll finish with thermography. So our condition-based maintenance scheme. 
So in level one, so our bit of term it, we've got uh, uh, level one is our in-service surveys, our online monitoring that have no impact on day-to-day -day operations of equipment. So that is the techniques that we've um, covered so far, but also when you're talking about transformers, it'll be DGA um, <coughs> or maybe ultrasound testing, for example. Um, and we can use the results of our online monitoring, our in-service surveys to inform level two, which is our planned outages, which we can use to perform offline testing um, techniques such as offline PD testing, insulation resistance, etc. Um, the offline techniques will be all be covered in the next series of, um, of webinars in in uh, next month in October. My colleague Ian Simmons will be leading them. Um, and then, of course, our offline testing, the results from that will inform uh, our, our online testing. So we'll go back into level one, the data operations. If our offline testing and online testing, so our levels one and two, it, say it suggests that something's, something's wrong, we can move into level three, which is our planned maintenance repairs. Um, and then, of course, on completion of that, we can move back into our level one day to day operations. And then, of course, our final step is planned asset replacement. If our maintenance repairs are being informed by our surveys and our offline testing suggests that an asset is, is on its way out, then we can plan for replacement rather than waiting for it to fail in service. Of course, then we go back with a new asset, we go back to our level one. So this whole, the whole presentation today, we're talking about our level one, our service level, um, servers and online monitoring. So our online testing, we've got some pros and cons to online testing. Of course, one pro, the, the plant is under normal op operating conditions. So we're, we're, we're seeing it in, in the, the condition that it is most of the time. Um, you don't require any outages to perform online testing. And we can use the results from our online testing to inform outage and maintenance planning. The cons, plants and normal operating conditions. So this means that all of the, all of the noise um, and ex, ex, you know, external noise that could interfere with our, our results and measurements is all present. So we've got to be aware when we're performing online testing that there, there is a noise issue with a lot of, a lot of the, the testing that we'll be doing. Plus there are a limited set of measurements that we can actually perform. Our online testing techniques. So I'll reiterate again, we're going to go through them in, in the order that we've got here. So we've got partial discharge analysis, electromagnetic interference diagnostics, most current signature analysis, vibration, then tomography will finish with. Okay, so electrical discharges. Uh, electrical discharges in insulation are the primary cause of a lot of. Uh, a lot of insulation degradation in rotating plant. Um, what happens when we have a discharge? Um, we get a number of things, a number of effects that um, that uh, result from a discharge. One of them being heat. So discharge can cause local superheating of dielectric, um, which is a contributing factor to thermal degradation uh, of solid insulation systems. We then got um, electromagnetic uh, radiation coming out um, due to you know due to the nature of the of the discharge it will release a broadband broadband uh, electromagnetic radiation from radio waves all the way up through infrared visible to ultraviolet in some cases high frequency radiation can contribute to chemical degradation uh, through ionization events um, especially for air cooled machines you'll see that um, discharge events can um, create ozone uh, which will then uh, then itself attack the chemical um, solid insulation systems and that's our our third effect our uh, chemical changes and then we've got uh, finally we've got uh, an acoustic so a sound wave the thunder that accompanies every electrical discharge um, you know, due to the rapid expansion, due to the uh, localized superheating, you'll get a uh, uh, vibration coming out that um, is, you know, in the audible range, but can go up to ultrasonic. Um, so it's quite a common way to detect discharges in passive equipment, 
um, such as switch gears, transformers, and cables. Um, we tend not to use acoustic um, acoustic sensors for rotating plant because there are high ambient noise levels, sort of acoustic noise levels um, in general. Moving on to partial discharge analysis. What is it? I'm sure many people will have heard of partial discharge analysis. Um, it's a time domain technique that we use for condition monitoring insulation systems, primarily in rotating machines. Um, each discharge event is quantified in terms of its polarity, amplitude, frequency, and phase relationship. Measurements are typically done to the IEC 60270 standard, which specifies that your test circuits to be used and um, how um, all the measured and derived quantities as well. Um, on the left, you'll see a typical representation of partial discharge. Um, so we've got uh, a plot of uh, phase, so um, what part of the, uh, the power, free, uh, power cycle um, an event is happening on, um, a magnitude, so in this case it's charge measured in peak coulombs, and then we've got a frequency, which is the, associated with the colour of the, of the point. So the, in this particular um, case, the sort of fuchsia, uh, pink, uh, are high you know, high frequency events, and the uh, yellow and greens are lower frequency lower frequency events. So what what defects can cause partial discharges? Um, things that we uh, are, are you know interested in: voids, cracks, delaminations in solid insulation systems. We can have um, sharp edges or protrusions um, nearby or even inside our insulation systems. Any conducting particles, so this could be um, you know, swarf from, dr from dr um, drilling or grinding, uh, for example. Um, and then we've got uh, corona or surface discharge type events. Uh, here's a brief overview of how a patch discharge would occur. So we've got um, a few sine waves here. We've got one which is the uh, the voltage applied, and then we've got a sort of a discharge current uh, sign wave as well. So we see as as the voltage increases across in the rising part of the cycle, we it'll reach an inception voltage for our our discharge event, and then uh, so we've reached the threshold of the breakdown voltage for that particular void, uh, we'll say, um, and then we have a discharge event, which uh, which brings it down to the extinction voltage. And then because we're still in the rising part of our cycle, the voltage is still increasing, so it increases again to our inception voltage. We have another discharge event and it goes drops down to our extinction voltage. And it repeats a number of times um, throughout the cycle. And it's the same on the, you know, the falling part of the cycle and then the rising part on the other side. That's a basic overview of how a partial discharge would event would occur. So how do we translate that into a plot? So this is another example of the same diagram we've shown. So we've got a number of discharge events there. Um, on our monitoring equipment, it may, uh, one cycle may look something like this. And then as we plot a number of these single cycles onto, a, onto a, a one graph, we'll get a plot that looks something like this, where we can see our noise floor of our equipment uh, along the bottom is where we've got, you know, very high frequency of uh, repetition, and then our discharge events are above that and less frequent. Um, we can tell what we are, well, we can have a good idea of what type of discharge um, event we're looking at in these patterns um, because certain patterns do follow certain, you know, certain defects will produce certain patterns. Um, so we'll go through a couple of these examples. Uh, for example, so a corona type discharge, so an ionization event of gas, um, very common in air-cooled machines, um, but you also find it around, typically around power lines as well, very high, you know, high voltage transmission lines, you'll, you'll see corona type discharges. Um, and it will, depending on where it is. So if we see here, we've got a, a sharp point that is causing a corona type discharge on the HV side. So that's our, the top left 
um, sine wave in our diagram, we'd expect to see a lot of pulses in the negative half cycle. But if we had our sharp point on the grounded side of, of, of the gap, then we'd expect to see them on the positive half cycle. And there's a similar thing for corona in oil, uh, where we would have you know, there's, there's, there's the similar um, pulse distribution, but we'd have more um, sort of background noise, for example. And then this is a typical example of what one might look like in uh, a one single cycle, and then over multiple cycles, we we'll may, may end up with a diagram that looks like this. Um, voids or service discharges um, with so with one discharge close to a uh, contact of an electrode. So in our H3 rotating machines, we would expect the any voids or dis you know, discharges occurring at the conductor surface or close to the conductor surface would have a positive half cycle predominance and uh, discharges that are you know, on, on the edge of our insulation system uh, or maybe um, you know, close to the uh, state slots um, would have a negative predominance. And then voids within the insulation system itself that have, you know, that between the two would have a more, more balanced um, more balanced appearance between the two half cycles. Left there we have uh, what's typical of a single cycle of a service discharge, uh, and then here we've got so a service discharge just being on the neg on the um, you know, the grounded side of our electron system, and this is what it would look like um, when we have multiple cycles that we plot on the same graph. And a void type discharge that we have sort of within an insulation system, so we have a more balanced uh, approach between the negative and positive half cycles. A single cycle would look something like this, and then a, a um, you know, multiple cycles plotted would look something like this. We've got uh, another one here where which we'd have called typical of contact noise. So they've got a, a bad a bad contact between two conductors. You know, any bolted connection that's not not tight and inducted properly. You know, you've got um, they'll have quite a similar thing like this. where you have got a small gap that you're just having um, sparking going across. So you would see a number of pulses that are a pretty constant amplitude across, and it would have been, it generally appears at the uh, zero crossings. A typical online measurement system would be something like this. You, in order to do online partial discharge analysis, you would require um, capacitive couplers to be installed. Um, one particular setup uh, would be something like this, where you've got three line-in capacitors and one um, neutral um, coupler. Uh, but some systems have six line-in capacitors to do sort of, um, some time of flight discrimination. Uh, to give you an idea if it's from within the machine or external in the bus system uh, for example but you would take the, uh, the the outputs of these capacitors you'd stick them through your measurement system and then typically view them on a server computer but um, those more um, more recent innovations would have it all in one all in one machine of course we've got um, this is just a one setup for um, spot measurements um, but you can have, get continuous monitoring systems that can, uh, that can do all the trending uh, for you. Um, with partial discharge analysis, there are a number of factors that we need to also take into account when we're taking our measurements. And that is um, what the ambient conditions are, ambient uh, temperature and, and low conditions are. Because partial discharge paper will, will change with load and with temperature. Um, because um, when we've got a, a cool machine, the insulation system's contracted a bit, the voids are smaller, we expect to see less, less discharge activity than we have one when we're at operating temperature and the, uh, the insulation system is expanded um, and those voids open up. So a good, a, good, um, a good system to use if you are using partial discharge analysis to see how, how this, the characteristics would change. Um, you could start uh, cold at no load, uh, see what the initial condition is, then bring it up to load, 
do another measurement, then waiting for the temperature to rise to operating temperature, take another set of measurements, and then bring the load down to get a final set of measurements. There you get a good characteristic uh, of that machine. Uh, the how we analyze the test results uh, typically based on the low con the conditions that we've just sort of mentioned, plus any trends in the, the activity. So a typical rule of thumb in the industry is if the magnitude of the activity doubles in six months or less, it's a sign of uh, quite severe insulation deterioration. The trace signature, so the um, what the pattern looks like, uh, as well as inception and extinction voltages. Comparison between phases or readings between similar machines. Correlation with other, other tests, online, offline tests and give us a good indication as to what the discharge activity is. And oh yeah, and the slide that we just discussed there. I can see we've had quite a few people uh, join us since the start of the webinar. Uh, so for the people who've joined, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Um, just to let you know, we're gonna be handling the questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, you can put your questions into the questions tab in the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, if you click the little box with the little arrow inside it on the right hand side where it says questions, you can undock that questions tab, pull it to a different screen and it's a lot easier to use. Um, Mike, I'll hand back over to you. Okay, thank you Simon. So we'll now we'll move into electromagnetic interference diagnostics. So what is what is EMI diagnostics? A precise measurement of activity in the radio part of our electromagnetic spectrum, so 50 kilohertz to 100 megahertz, using a spectrum analyzer connected to a temporarily placed split core HFCT on a neutral or safety earth. Um, you can also, if there are couplers installed, you can also um, just connect onto any previously installed cluster couplers to do this, this measurement. It doesn't require HFCT solely. Um, it's, we're in our electromagnetic, you know, the electromagnetic part of our discharge event, um, and these signals can be both radiated and conducted away from a defect site. Um, the EMI data is measured in two formats. But first, we have a frequency domain signature that we call the frequency domain, which is we call our EMI signature or EMI trace. Uh, a typical Typical unit, uh, um, a generator would look something like this. And we'll go into the, um, the specifics of that in a few slides. We then have the time domain, or sometimes it's called zero span. So this is the what the pattern is at a specific frequency in our spectrum. So for example, here we've got um, uh, an example of a good excitation signature at 132 and a half kilohertz. We can also synchronize our time domain, uh, time domain data to a power cycle, local power cycle um, to facilitate some basic phase resolved uh, discharge analysis. And we can also perform our EMI survey for radiated signals using an electromagnetic sniffer, uh, which can improve our fault location. Uh, the sniffer is very useful for motors, for example, to see check for discharges through bearings. Um, and things like that. So what do we see when we're in the inner time domain? How do we distinguish between different events? So we've got the, the difference between partial discharge events and arcing events is quite um, quite stark in um, with EMI testing. In partial discharge analysis, you wouldn't see the arcing events um, because they're the systems that you, you have um, sort of discriminate against them. But we've got our partial discharges, which are you know, the rapid um, charge transfer across a void, for example, that we typically see. Each PD event has very fast rise and fall time, very broadband, um, broadband electromagnetic radiation comes out as a result of that. And um, due to our very sharp rise and fall times, it appears as a very narrow peak in our in our time domain plots. Whereas arcing events are an electrical event where there is 
some current flow rather than just a charge transfer. Um, typical arcing, um, arcing spots in rotating machines are shaft grounding brushes, uh, loose connections, or broken conductors. Since there's current flow through a conductor, um, there's some sort of inductance involved, which would which lowers the sort of frequencies that uh, are generated through this event. Um, but um, because there's some time involved for this arc to strike and then extinguish, um, the events take longer than a PD, um, a PD event. So as a result in our time domain, we see them as wider pulses. So we can see there are two in our, our sort of um, our example here. They've been marked with asterisks, which we can see that they are quite significant, more, uh, significantly wider than the um, than the PD events, which are just the narrow pulses. Um, other types of patterns that we see, we can see quite typically in the EMI diagnostics are corona and random noise patterns. So they're typical of insulation contamination, especially in air-cooled machines. Um, we would not typically see corona type discharges in a hydrogen core machine um, just because of the, the nature of the of hydrogen suppressing suppressing these types of events but in air cool machines um, corona type uh, activities is can be very common um, so the corona type pattern we've got a, low, a large number of low energy discharges that are produced all, sort of on or very close to the surface of the insulation and as a result, for the, with that, it's all the, it follows the power frequency as well. So that's how we we can we can see our strong corona pattern in the example. There is looks like a bit a bit more like a, a sine wave than than our other discharge types. Um, and then random noise. Um, so this is just a, a high level of random noise. Of course, random noise is also an indication of nothing happening. Um, if we got it low levels, because that would be associated with the noise floor of our equipment and or any sort of detector that we've got. But when we talk about random noise from insulation contamination, we're talking about you know um, <clears throat> sort of twenty or so decibels between the you know, peak, the maximum and minimum values in our random noise. Um, very common in um, machines in dusty environments. Um, where the filters don't get changed regularly enough, you get a high level of, of conducting contamination on the surface of the windings, and that will lead to a high random noise pattern. Um, here is a, a rough rule of thumb for um, different um, different locations of, dis of discharge activity in our EMI spectrum. Um, there is some overlap. Um, Depending on the local conditions, but this is a good, a good sort of diagram to show rules of thumb. So our lower lower frequency ends, we are further inside our machine, quote unquote, inside our machine, and at the bottom end, we typically see anything to do with the exciter. So our excitation system dominates the lower end of our spectrum. Then, as we increase the frequency up to around one megahertz. We tend to see anything that's any activity is happening in the stator, the slot portion of the windings in this data. Increase the uh, frequency again to around five megahertz. We see the core edge of the stator. Increase the frequency again to around 10 megahertz. We tend to see end winding problems. And then anything that's typically 20 megahertz or above is generally external in uh, bus or associated cable system. Um, like I say, there's a rough rules of thumb and there's quite a lot of overlap if you've got a very strong bus discharge, for example, sometimes I've seen it all the way down to one megahertz before. Um, but of course, in, in between this as well, we've got a load of external transmitters that we need to be aware of as well. We've got all of our radio stations, um, your AM radio bands, typically 500 kilohertz to one megahertz. Shortwave radios typically 10 to 20 megahertz, and our FM radio is typically 85 to 105 megahertz. So within our EMI spectrum, we've got all, all of those external signals like that, plus 
for local communication signals, data transmitters, and a whole host of other external external things that we can we can pick up um, in electromagnetic interference diagnostic sites. Um, for generators, we typically prefer the neutral earth uh, for the placement of our HFCTs, uh, but we can also use a safety earth if, depending on the local site conditions, the neutral earth is not accessible, um, or we can use previously installed plastic couplers. Um, for motors, we typically go on to a power cable or power conduit, um, whichever is available, but Again, if one isn't available, then a safety earth can be used. Uh, analysis of EMI test results, we typically base these things on trends. So how has, it how has it changed over time? What the time domain signatures look like? Comparisons between phases or readings for similar machines and changes in um, signature for different operating conditions. So we'll go through a couple of examples the next few slides of EMI signatures. So this is the, the one that we had on the first, the first slide of our EMI section. So what we've got here, no major problems with the generator. So in our low, lower part of our frequency spectrum, we've got a lot of uh, excitation noise. Um, and then at the higher frequency end, the, there has been um, some indication of bus discharges. The data was collected at two loads to detect loose windings. Um, so that works because uh, an increase in a state current increases electromagnetic vibration, and increasing electromagnetic vibration also raises the ambient EMI levels. So if we got if we tested two different loads with a sufficient enough um, difference, um, if we see a significant difference. Uh, we can have a good indicator of whether or not the windings are are becoming loose in the in the slots. The winding is tight in this case, but we've got some discharge in our bus system. Here's another one. We've got um, uh, excitation. We've got external transmitters there, AM radio, FM radio, various data transmitters also been identified. Um, in this case, our EMI can also identify problems in excitus. The excitotones for this level were considered to be high for this particular for this particular generator, and there was also some arcing present in the, in the signature. So we've shown both the shown both of these um, pictures before, but what we would expect a good excitation system to look like um, on the left there, where we've got evenly spaced pulses of similar magnitude, um, we would have for a full wave. Rectifier, you know, rectifier excitation system, we'd have six pulses per power cycle. Um, but in the case for, uh, for this example, this is what was found, where there are a number of arcing, arcing uh, events in the, in the system there. And it turned out that one of the four static excitation cables had, um, had a loose connection and was discharging. So this is what was found when they, um, you know, went in and did the, some, some maintenance. Uh, one example of a, a good excitation cable on the left there and what the, uh, the loose cable um, turned out looking like. Uh, we can directly compare between identical assets in the same location, can give us a good idea of the condition, relative conditions of, the, of these units. So in this case, all the testing was um, was performed on a frame safety ground. Um, and here we can see that the unit three safety ground is not functioning properly. It's not sort of earthed correctly. Um, and then when we, you know, if we do this before and after maintenance, we can check if the maintenance has been successful. In this case, we can see that the repair was successful and the ground is now working as we would expect it to. Um, one example here of um, some bus discharges uh, for this particular one, a generator had just been rewound and um, one phase of the IPB had developed a strong PD. Um, so this, we were brought in to do this test um, because the PD system that they'd 
the client had at the time said it suggested that the discharge could, was coming from the generator itself. So we came in to have a look and we saw that actually we've got a lot of bus noise in one particular phase. So we measured the discharges from each of the couplers and the discharges measured from the A phase coupler were orders of magnitude larger than the B and C phases. Um, the, the site enforced a mini outage on this unit um, shortly after the testing uh, to inspect the standoff insulators in the bus system close to the generator terminals and we found evidence of discharge on both the uh, bus bar itself and and on the um, standoff insulator heads uh, plus um, a lot of signs of other moisture ingress um, which um, was most likely the cause of of the sort of the discharge that um, during the rewind when they'd had the terminals uh, disconnected they hadn't covered the the end of the IPB properly and as a result some moisture moisture and other contaminants had got in, in and uh, it started to affect the, the bus system on this phase. So whilst we you know whilst it's a very loud discharge source um, it's a very well, it's very slow failure mechanism. It takes a very a very long time at high levels for for um, bus discharges to cause a failure. But by identifying the source of this this discharge activity, we can perform some proper maintenance on the bus system, and we can eliminate this strong source of EMI, um, which will allow for the identification of so lower lower magnitude um, failure mechanisms. Uh, moving on to motor current signature analysis. Um, again, non-invasive online condition monitoring technique. This is specific to electric motors. We diagnose faults such as broken rotor bars, air gap eccentricity, shorted turns, uh, just a short list of the examples that we can, it can find. Um, the basis of this technique is the fact that real life motors are not ideal and they're all the all the phases that um, that supply them are not perfectly balanced by identifying the imbalances between the phases uh, can provide valuable information about the current state of the motor and any defects that are currently happening uh, are happening in 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 that motor it's quite a very it's quite a sensitive technique that can detect um, rose faults at an early stage which can prevent secondary damage as well as motor failure. Um, so it measures the current components that are a direct, a direct result of changing magnetic flux caused by faults in the machine. Uh, in contrast to vibrations themselves, which are caused by electrical faults and then are therefore second order effects. So we require quite a lot of damage to happen first before you can use vibration monitoring to um, detect a particular electrical fault. So measurements, uh, we use CT again on one of the supply phases and then it's attached to a spectrum analyzer. Um, you only need to put it on one, one of the phases because any change in flux will affect all the phases. The main peak in any spectrum uh, will be at power frequency and, and then Dominant sub peaks will be at the harmonics of the power frequency. Also present will be certain side bands and other harmonics depending on particular faults in the motor. Typical range of interest is from sort of DC to five kilohertz. And we've got a crude example there on the right hand side where you might find. Side bands and harmonics of particular fault conditions can be calculated. Um, there are lots of equations that you can find in technical papers um, that will provide the expected um, the peaks uh, peak values of different um, different fault conditions such as broken rotor bars, static and dynamic air gap eccentricities, interstone shorts, any bearing damage or gearbox damage. They all have a particular equations that can predict where where in the spectrum you would expect to see a peak. Um, as a result of that particular fault.
moving on to vibration monitoring itself, vibration. So this monitoring technique where we measure the vibration and kinetic energy of rotating machines. It's one of the simplest, oldest, and very, it's a very successful technique, um, especially when used in combination with other monitoring techniques. Uh, it's widely applicable because all machines will vibrate um, and each machine will vibrate with a unique signature, which can then be analyzed for any developing fault conditions. So as vibration, vibration um, signature changes, it can give you a good indication of something else changing in the machine. As a health experience between vibration it will change and you quantify the um, deviations and you can use it to determine which which components failing and what the fault condition is. There are many sources of vibration in our rotating machines. There's any looseness caused by incorrectly fastened mountings, clearances or wear, uh, fatigue and wear of components due to poor manufacturing, maintenance, lubrication, or even overloading of the machine, uh, misalignment of, of, the, of the machine uh, caused by installation errors or operating factors, uh, electrical imbalances in the machine um, caused by manufacturing defects, etc. Uh, bearing faults. Uh, bearing faults are the most common failure mechanism for um, electric motors or motors in general. Um, if it's, if I remember rightly, uh, the did a, there was a study in two thousand four, I think it was, um, on sources of a failure in electrical machines, and fifty one percent of all failures of electric motors were due to bearing failure. So bearing faults are uh, the primary primary um, mode of failure for electrical motors. And then res any resonance issues and electromagnetically induced forces. By measuring and analyzing our vibration data, we can have a lot of valuable information about the health of our machine. Um, we can monitor and plan for any, any failure conditions that, uh, that may arise. There are other effects from, um, from excessive vibration that also make it important to monitor. Um, machines lose quite a lot of energy through vibrations, um, so will therefore consume more power and make them more expensive to operate. And vibrations can be hazardous to health from both physical contact with the vibrating machine and from the noise that um, excessive vibration can, um, can emanate or can put out. Uh, three variables that we um, monitor in order to quantify vibration, so absolute displacement, velocity, and then acceleration. All of these quantities are related to and can be derived from, from each other. So as a result, we typically only measure one. Um, it's usually acceleration um, using a, a small accelerometer. It can be very difficult to interpret raw waveforms as uh, you'll get quite a, a noisy, a noisy signature. So we typically convert the raw waveform into a, fre a frequency domain graph, as we've seen with um, with our other technique, you know, our EMI analysis and motor color current signature analysis. You know, we convert our raw, raw waveforms into um, frequency domain, and where we'd see something like this. So our Raw vibration waveforms quite noisy, difficult to interpret, but when we convert it into a frequency domain signature, we have a, a better idea of what is going on in the machine. Um, accelerometers are the most commonly used sensor, um, and the location of sensors is very critical for effective monitoring of vibration. Bearings um, can carry forces such as rotation as well as the weight of the rotor itself. And it's here that most machines will experience damage that can cause vibrations. So most of the time you'll find um, vibration monitoring, uh, vibration accelerometers 
will be placed on bearings. Um, this should be firmly mounted as close to the center line as possible. And in order to capture all the information about a particular, particular machine, um, you should mount multiple um, vibration sensors in different orientations. Uh, a few examples of um, particular orientations and placements are given on the diagram on the right hand side there. Of course, bearings are not the only critical component which, uh, which vibrates. Um, as the size of our generators increase, um, so too does the magnitude of forces acting upon the windings themselves and state end windings can experience very high um, very high um, high vibrations as well. Um, so excessive vibration can damage any coolant lines that may be running through the windings and also contribute to general looseness of, of windings themselves. Um, Strong electric fields you find inside these um, these generators are make the typical piezoelectric accelerometer unsuitable for this location. But we've got some recent advances that have led to the creation of fiber optic accelerometers, um, which we can use for end winding monitoring. Um, because it's based on a visible light, um, it's not affected by the strong electromagnetic fields, and we can this suitable for use in the in the harsh conditions of a generator. So just as we move into the last section here on thermography, just a reminder that if you have any questions, we'll handle them at the end and to put them into the questions tab in the GoToWebinar control panel. And Mike will do his best to answer them at the end. Mike, back to you. Thank you, Simon. So thermography. Thermography. Why measure temperature in, in the first place? Um, in our electrical machines, there are many faults that will cause an increase in temperature. Uh, electrical short circuits, broken rotor bars in motors, loose connections, winding contamination, insufficient cooling, bearing damage. Um, plus, there are also faults that are caused by increased temperature, such as um, thermal aging of insulation. So increases above normal operating temperatures can be a good indicator of developing poor conditions. Um, for our you know, temperatures of, of machines and windings, we typically use um, things called RTD, so um, electrical temperature measurement device that's based on how the electrical resistance changes with temperature. So in this case, there's a positive relationship with, with temperature, so the resistance of the um, of the device will um, go up with, as the temperature increases. So typically constructed from a thin length of, of wire round around, wound around a glass or ceramic core within a protective sheath. So advantages and disadvantages, they are um, generally very cheap uh, as well. Um, high accuracy, a very good temperature range, um, and very stable measurement and a linear response. Disadvantages, you have to actively excite them, um, which can maybe skew some measurements in uh, if you need very, very um, precise um, measurements. And the response time is 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 lower or, or higher, I guess I should say, uh, higher than um, other, um, other sensors. So the changes in temperature will not be, um, you know, detected as quickly. Um, uh, thermography, what else can we do with thermography? Uh, we can use an infrared imager. So it works just like a regular digital camera, but it focuses infrared part of the spectrum instead of visible light. Um, a sensor then converts that infrared into a electrical signal, which is typically um, converted into a false color image called a thermogram. So where you've got typically um, darker Colors are represented, uh, represent cooler areas and the light spots represent hotter areas. From the thermogram, we can easily identify abnormal temperature variations that are indicative of certain electrical or mechanical faults. Um, so by providing a broad picture of temperature, we can use to identify certain faults, such as gas leaks, for example, in machines, or if you've got um, 
poor poor cooling in a particular particular motor for example you maybe see one part of the motor being hotter than the rest of them um, it's not um, using an infrared image is not really applicable to um, generators especially large turbo generators um, just because of the, the nature of the machine um, uh, but we can use it to identify other faults that are associated with generation systems uh, the example that i've got here is um, an example of circulating currents in a bus system so this is um, the bus um, just below um, the generator terminals here so in the visible light image on the right hand side you can see sort of two areas of of discoloration uh, on the center phase there are sort of where the where the paint has been cooked away and but it's even more apparent when we look in the infrared spectrum that the um, that there are hot spots um, generated by circulating currents in this bus system so just to uh, summarize the presentation that we've We've just done we've got online testing so it's level one of our condition-based maintenance scheme and it helps to inform when we plan to progress to other levels we talked about a few of the main techniques for auto you that we use for rotating machines such as partial discharge analysis electromagnetic interference diagnostics motor current signature analysis vibration monitoring and thermography um, each technique will provide an insight to a machine's condition but as as you pro would probably be aware that all monitoring techniques are more effective when you use them in combination with other uh, monitoring techniques and with other other testing results that you you may have access to uh, we've got a few more upcoming webinars so if you want to see this one again in person then it'll, it, it's happening next uh, one week from today at uh, this time but in October we've got the our level two of our condition based maintenance scheme we've got uh, offline testing of rotating machines uh, in November best practices for new transformer procurement engineering and then in December points of factory witnessing routine testing and factory acceptance testing so that um, brings this presentation to a conclusion so we can move on to any questions great you, thank you very much mike uh that was great um yeah with the upcoming webinars um as mike says uh we will repeat this one at a slightly later time next tuesday uh to give people a second chance everybody who's online uh, and those who've actually missed will get sent a, a link to a recording so even if you can't uh, make one of the webinars but you're interested please register we will send you a a, a link so you can uh, play it on demand afterwards and in terms of planning the upcoming webinars, we'd love to hear from you um, about what topics you'd like to hear. So rather than us guessing, uh, please let us know. As Mike showed at the very beginning of the webinar, Dover has a very wide range of services and equipment and techniques at its disposal to help support you in your day-to-day -day jobs. Um, so let us know what you'd like to hear about, and um, we'll try and put on webinars uh, to cover that. Um, if you look online, you can see the ones we've done in the past. Um, and if you've missed anything, reach out to us again and we can send you links to let you listen to the ones from, from previous months. Uh, Mike's email address is up there as well uh, on the screen at the moment. So if you think of something afterwards, please get in touch and we'll be happy to help. Um, we've got a few questions come in, Mike. Um, so opportunity for anybody else to type their questions in at the moment. Uh, Fairly general one to start, and I think you've probably covered this, but it's actually quite a, it does get to a crux of some of the problems. How do we distinguish between noise and true PD? Yeah, that's a, a very good question. Um, in, there are a lot of techniques that we can use to eliminate noise when we're doing partial discharge analysis. Uh, we can gate signals, you can, um, you can choose your measurement circuit in a certain way. You can use lower capacitance couplers, um, and that will um, act as a high-pass filter. So you'll find that a lot of the um, 
noise in uh, when you are uh, measuring online will be at the lower part of the spectrum, lower part of the frequency spectrum. So if you use lower capacitor, uh, lower capacitance couplers, uh, you can filter essentially sort of filter out that um, that noise. Um, but uh, a lot of a lot of it will come down to um, the the pattern that you see. So if you've got just got random noise in a, in a system, then you'll see it across the whole the whole power cycle. Whereas in in um, um, whereas in oh, what am I trying to say? Yeah, whereas in for uh, actual defects, you'll you will see a particular pattern. But if you're unsure, what you could do is you could then um, schedule um, offline PD tests. So that's where you can control the amount of uh, the um, amount of ambient noise in, in the system because you are um, you know eliminating the operational noise um, and and energizing the windings using a, a PD free source. So then you'll have a, a good indication of if there is a true PD or not, um, if you do online, offline uh, partial discharge testing. Great. Um, since you've been talking about couplers, um, the same person's come back and said, if, if you're installing permanent couplers, would you go for a high or lower capacitance? Uh, personally, I, I, I feel that using the lower capacitance couplers is, is the wrong way about it because Whilst you do have a noisy signal, you um, you you will be able to to measure more of the winding. So what I mean by that, if so, measure more of the winding if you use higher capacitance couplers. So what I mean by that is that in in our generators, we've got you know a lot of um, a lot of copper, and there's a lot of there's a long way to go from say deep inside the state of winding. Where you might have slot discharges and and other insulation related discharges, um, there's a long way for those signals to travel to get conducted to where our couplers are, and um, a lot of the content that we that you get from um, a lot of the the higher frequency content that it, of that of those um, discharge events will attenuate before they or attenuate below what we can detect at the couplers. So I, I personally would recommend you install higher um, capacitance couplers. Uh, one nanofarad is quite common. Um, I have seen some systems that come with nine nanofarad um, uh, couplers, but I would I would go with the higher value capacitance because then you can be certain that you're detecting everything rather than just the high free high frequency uh, signals that will reach the couplers from. Um, at that particular location, so you typically see maybe the you know the last last part of the end windings or, or a small portion of the slot if you're using the low lower capacitance couplers. Okay, thank you. Um, whilst we're on a, a roll about uh, couplers, um, somebody's asked. So we're moving on to EMI and saying, yeah. you know, is a capacitive coupler of 80 nanofarads, sorry, 80 picofarads okay for an EMI measurement? Um, uh, so I have used them um, successfully um, in the past. So the, the IPB example that we had in, in the at the end of our EMI spectrum uh, section, so th those were measured on 80 peak for our couplers. So you can you can you can do it um, um, but we don't really have a, a, an idea of how much um, the, the coupler in that case is attenuating our, you know, our low frequency signals. So you've just got to keep in mind if you're doing EMI testing um, the measuring circuit that you've got. Um, so if you're using lower value, you know, lower capacitance couplers that are installed, um, you would have a, a, a better indication of the true value of the higher frequency part of the spectrum than you would have the lower frequency part of the spectrum. But um, with a lot of these, a lot of EMI testing, you would just you could use what is available to a particular machine, and then you can if you use the same um, measurement system um, to trend over time. So if you went back to that same machine, 
and um, and did the testing on the same couplers, then you could compare the results um, with each other, and you could get a good uh, indication of if there are any fault conditions that are developing that way. Great, thank you. And since you mentioned uh, buzz dots, um, one of the questions says here is. Which is uh, which diagnostic technique is preferable for buzz duck uh, and switch gear, PD or EMI? Uh, well, in in my personal experience, uh, I found that EMI has been more successful in finding um, discharge events in buzz ducks. Um, the way with or, or being able to tell that it, that any discharge events are coming from the bus ducks. Um, partial discharge analysis is um, it's quite, can be quite tricky to tell where they're coming from um, because it'll just plot everything on the same everything that it detects on the same on the same um, graph um, and and for with that uh, we can see some companies have gone with a time of flight sort of discrimination so that's the systems that have typically have six line end couplers, so two on each phase. And couplers are usually spaced about six to 10 meters apart. So usually at the, um, you know, the line end, and then at, uh, if there's an excitation transformer, um, usually at, at that point as well, because they usually spaced about that, that far apart. And then depending on the time at which uh, each coupler detects a certain signal, it can give you an indication of which direction it's coming from. So either the machine side in between the two couplers or on the bus side further further towards the transformer. Um, the problem with the time of flight discrimination is that um, you've got to have a very high resolution um, detector. So because these, you know, obviously all these signals are traveling at the speed of light. Um, so um, You've got to have a very, very high resolution uh, detection system in order to tell which one has arrived first. Um, and because because they, they can be very expensive, these systems generally are not as high resolution as would be ideal. And so you you seem to have a, a couple of meters of blind spot around each coupler, whereas it, where if if a discharge happens, say between the two couplers, uh, but um, quite close to one of them, it can't tell if it's, you know, if it's com coming, from, uh, which side of the coupler it's, it's sort of coming from. Um, so that's why I'd said that EMI has been more effective for um, bus ducts um, in my personal experience. Um, the, there is also one element of EMI testing that we can use uh, where we've got a, a small handheld EMI sniffer. It's a small, of AM radio detector really um, but that is very good at uh, picking up local discharges so when you're walking along a bus duct if, if you've got access to it of course and many bus duct systems are are inaccessible you know several meters above your head um, but in some cases where the, you've got access to some of the bus ducts you can use the sniffer along the bus duct to see where where the signals are highest, and we've used that um, on many sites uh, in the UK and abroad to find location, you know, sources of discharge in um, in bus systems. And do you want to make some comments about switchgear as well? Uh, switchgear, um, switchgear. It's quite tricky to do PD testing on switchgears because, um, especially online. Because you would have to require, you know, um, a dedicated coupler to be installed, and they're, you know, few hard, hard to find most of the time. But um, EMI testing you can use for switchgear. Again, we'd probably be using the sniffer rather than um, rather than a CT because a lot, on a lot of switchgear there's not a suitable point to connect uh, a CT to. Um, but um, a sniffer is very, can be uh, very effective for finding sources of um, of discharge in switchgear systems as well. And many many of the permanent 
PD monitoring solutions for you know uh, switch gear now are based on a permanent sniffer effectively clamped on the outside of the the, the cabinet. Yeah, I would add that. So um, because it's easy to install, I think that that's where the, the one of the, the main drivers there. Um, so uh, we have one, one last question here, and if anybody else wants to type something in quickly, and this comes on to talking about vibrations, so we're on to a slightly different topic now, uh, about what are the limits for end winding vibration in utility generators, and it, obviously this person is specifically talking about directly water-cooled epoxy micro windings, and are the limits different for GVPI machines? I must admit, I don't know what GVPI stands for. So, global I'm, vacuum. I'm a cable guy. I don't do rotating machines. Oh, that's okay. Um, <laughs> so, my, whilst my uh, personal experience of vibration monitoring is, is limited to sort of a service understanding, um, uh, I couldn't directly talk about limits. Um, if you are looking for specific limits to a generator that you are uh, owner operate, then you're best off talking to uh, your uh, OEM, um, but um, I would I would imagine that um, things that uh, directly water cooled windings would have a a stricter um, you know a stricter limit than um, any non directly cooled windings just because you know um, your vibration you know fatigue um, will be more more um it, well i suppose the more directly water cooled windings would have um you know would be more prone to failure in high vibration situations than um just a you know a general gvpi machine um because of course once you've got a small crack in in you know one of the coolant lines um that can form a leak and a water leak in the generator can cause a failure quite quite quickly I would add that possibly for um, general general guidance and general information, actually there are probably some very good uh, technical brochures from Seagray, um, yeah. who often issue guidance around such things, which you you would be able to find on uh, it's um, the Seagray website, which is e e hyphen seagray.org, um, and that's about everything that Seagray publishes. That's where you can you can search for it. Um, and we have one one final question, and we're we're back back to PD, um, but specifically talking about hydro generators this time. So, like, uh, and it says, yeah, as you pointed out, PD depends on temperature and load. But when we're testing a hydro plant, they're often running for a very short period of time, and so it never actually gets up up to temperature. Mm -hmm. So, any, well, any kind of monitoring PD on um, such generators? Uh, yeah, well, PD monitoring is is still applicable in in that case. Um, you would just say that our normal operating condition is the lower temperature. In that case, if if you're just running a peaking plant um, for your you know hydro peaking plant, then um, you you're right. You wouldn't be running for a, a great amount of time. Would be you know an hour here or there. But um, but then if you were wanting to use partial discharge to monitor these these types of plant, then you would just say that our normal operating temperature is is the low temperature and you try and um, try and trend it based on that rather than rather than trying to get it to be its rated operating temperature. That makes perfect sense to me. Yeah. Um, with that, we have no more questions. Um, so I'd like to thank everybody for uh, listening in today. We really appreciate your time. Um, we hope you found today's webinar uh, informative. Um, if you do have questions, as I said earlier, do reach out to us. If you have suggestions for uh, future webinars, do let us know. Um, as Mike pointed out earlier, Mike, do you just want to go back one slide? Um, uh, yeah. In a month's time, um, we'll be looking at offline testing of generators and motors. And then November, December is very much looking at the transformer procurement process specifications in November and then factory witnessing and testing in December. 
Um, so we're doing another pair at, uh, at the end of the year. So with that, um, I'll close the webinar down. Thank you so much. As I say, you will get a web, uh, an email from us with a link to this recording. So enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Bye-bye.